Hi, I'm uh, Monet Christo. And I'm Dr. Franz Grunier. And you're watching The Dan Show, your healthy dose of dive safety tips and uh, so much more. of uh, Dan Southern Africa many years ago. Maybe you can give us a bit of background into that and um, sort of your thoughts on whether divers really know what Dan does and um, you know how we sort of get involved with the dive community. Just from my experience I've uh, noticed that when you talk about Dan, divers usually think of it as a diving insurance company or believe it or not, even a Swiss company, you know, so... Absolutely, uh, Danish, yeah. Danish. I have people knocking on yeah. the door saying, is this the Danish embassy? Or they greet me and say, hi Dan, how are you doing? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so yeah, any yeah. case, uh, I thought I'd just uh, ask you for some yes, of your thoughts. absolutely. Yeah. Well, the background really is that scuba diving is a unique sport in the sense that you have certain responsibilities to other people and uh, you're in a relatively remote or alien environment. And for that reason, people can not only get into trouble, but they also may on occasion need specialized treatment in the form of recompression. And there are only so many chambers in the world. And uh, years ago in America, it was realized that uh, divers were increasingly uh, diving in remote locations throughout the United States. They were getting into trouble. And at that stage, the military had to deal with it, and they weren't really set up to do that. So through a, an international and U.S. grant, they actually started uh, promoting the creation of an organization that would deal with this. Okay. So Jeff Davis actually started it as Leo Fast, and then Peter Bennett took it on and formed Dan America. And eventually, different continents really had champions that took the lead, Europe, Japan, and Asia Pacific. And uh, shortly after I qualified in medicine and had a passion for diving, I decided, well, I think it'd be really good to do that. Okay. That stage, Medical Rescue International was offering a program to help divers, and they started a first aid facility at Sudwana Bay, and it grew from there. All right. And in 95, I went to uh, Divers Alert Network America, and I did a handshake with Chris Wackels, and we were down in Southern Africa ever since. Wow, that's quite a story, I must say. Um, and look where it is now. You know, the, uh, the, the, I would say that the diving community has certainly embraced the organization as a yes. whole, I think, globally. But I think many people would like to know, are you a diver yourself? Yes, yes I am. You've reminded me though that uh, people sometimes think about the insurance thing, you know, mm -hmm. and I just want to bridge back if I can for a moment. Sure. More. People tend to think that Dan is an insurance and I think it's so important to tell you, relating to your question now, that we are divers, we're diving enthusiasts. I'm a diving instructor, I've done commercial diving, I mean it took over my life for a large part of it. Mm. And that's really the heart behind that. The reason why there's insurance is because we want to help people and you can only do so much over the phone before you need someone to do something that's gonna cost something. And offering a service or moving people to get a service without having insurance is ultimately a problem. And that's where the insurance came in. That's where it started in America. That's where yeah. it started here. It's a way to extend what we'd love to do to what we'd actually be able to do. Well, you know, that leads into another question I have, and I think in many ways, more than likely the heartbeat of Dan, and that's the hotline. And yes. uh, I mean, isn't that kind of where this whole Dan Absolutely. idea started? Divers phoning, people that know about issues with regards to diving problems, emergencies, and people providing with some advice and from their obviously it grew. But if we go back to its origins, um, the hotline is really what sets us apart from any other, call it dive insurance yes. then, I guess. And uh, I, you know, maybe we can explore some of the, the cases. I know we've dealt with many, Laurel, which I'm sure we'll introduce to you in another episode uh, at some stage. Uh, you know, it takes very sort of odd calls sometimes, interesting calls, and you know, other times they're quite scary to be quite frank. Yeah. So, I don't know, some of the ones that I know would be diabetes and diving questions. You know, the yes. guy just phones and says, you know, I've got this issue, you know, what medical advice do I have? And Laurel's very good at taking the call and all the other agents, by the way, um, and then passing that on to, say, 
without doctors like yourself. Yeah. Um, other issues, you know, decompression sickness, guys out in the field, they have an issue. But maybe there's one or two cases that you've dealt with that, um, you know, stick out and you maybe want to share your experience and how people can learn maybe better to use the hotline at the end of the day. Yes, yes. I think one of the things that just uh, I'd really like to bring out is that Dan is an interesting mix between a dive, wellness and safety organization and an emergency room. Yeah. You know, for the most part, people call and they need advice about malaria medication, motion sickness medication, what's wrong with my ear, you know, can I dive with this or that. So that's the dive safety and wellness club component in the medical information line that we really want people to feel is, is part of their uh, extended diving circle or yeah. and friendship circle. And on the other hand, there's this hotline that you can call if you were in trouble that is able to link you to whatever you need, given the realities, of course, where you are, to the help that ultimately would get you and the problem resolved. So that's the heart behind it. And you were mentioning the calls we've had. Well, I think the most unusual call I ever had yeah. was a lady who called. I've got a picture of her and ask her whether we can actually show it at some stage. But she called me. It was a, a strange hour. And she said, I was in the shower, there was a thunderstorm, and I've just been struck by lightning and came to, what should I do? Well, I suggested that she should express gratitude towards <laughs> whatever transcendent worldview she had. Yeah. But other than that, we arranged for her to go to a nearby hospital and be assessed, and she subsequently came to see me at one of the dive shows. And, uh, <laughs> okay. That was quite extraordinary. All right. still so, but that's what happened. Yes, yeah, she does uh, well in school diving, as far as I know. Yeah. Well, I do recall one many years ago, it's before I joined the organization, um, Francia Berman, the acting yes. CEO at this stage, mentioned to me that yourself and Dr. Amy Brits helped the guy um, that was stuck in Malawi. Yes. And, um, you know, that's some of the scarier things. I don't know if you want to maybe tell the guys um, listening uh, what that all was uh, about. You yes, know? yes. Uh, I think it, if I remember, is to try to get him across. Uh, uh, the border first of all and secondly he was quite sick yeah, and yeah. Uh, lastly uh, I think there was a complication moving him or something like that. Yes, yes. Well of course the initial priority mm. is assessment and stabilization. Even if it's decompression illness you have to focus on the priorities yeah. and one of the concerns we have and one of the reasons why Divers Alert Network has been reticent to give our chambers numbers is because the chamber may not be the first port of call, it may not be the appropriate place to start, mm -hmm. and in fact they may not be open, because sometimes these chambers come and go. So mm -hmm. the key is to decide, well, what do you have exactly where you are, where this has happened, given that it may be nothing more than a first aid kit, but what do you have going for you right there? And after that, the next thing is, well, how do I get to a greater level of assessment, a greater level of care? And if you're in a foreign country, you're on the expat or you're on holiday, and you need to go to a higher level of medical care, preferably back to your own country, then there's the issue with the immigration. And how do you get the yeah. plane in, given the complexities of Africa, the logistics of working with mm. the runways and so on. So those are all part of the mix that we've had, amongst other things, with yeah. a member in Malawi. And of course, what also happens is people join Dan Southern Africa because they're living abroad yeah. and then believe that Dan Southern Africa membership somehow will give them a way to get a South African medical aid equivalent. Mm. And yeah. that's a bit of a problem because yeah. they're actually residents in another country and we cannot import them to South Africa in order to receive South African medical care. So those are the things that we sometimes wrestle with yeah. and are part of the complexity uh, of moving people who get injured internationally and I think we need to talk about that some more at some stage yeah. but it's just something to consider. No, absolutely and I, I'd like to dig into those kind of topics as we um, you know, expand the, the series because it is important, I think there's a bit of a disconnect, uh, the expectation from the diver and then what the dance service offers, you know, they, uh, but any case, for another time, I'd like to just stop this whole thing here yeah, a little yeah. bit for, for a moment and reflect on a story the, the current medical director, Dr. Jack Mankies, uh, mentioned a while back and that was his time at the Navy base in Simonstown and he said on several occasions he was running a bit of a hotline there for, for the divers and usually on a Friday morning or Saturday morning, three, four o'clock, you know, 
uh, he'd get a call and uh, somebody would ask him if uh, there's a serious problem if somebody has just licked his eyeball. So uh, <laughs> we don't get those kind of calls by the hotline. Not usually. <laughs> yeah. usually. What we have had, of course, of someone calling me uh, in the middle of the night asking whether it's safe to die with breastfeeding. And yeah. uh, I had the presence of mind to say, yes, it is, but not at the same time. Okay. You know, we get those sort of <laughs> uh, who are you? I'm Dr. Franz Grenier. I'm Orne Christo, and you watch The Dan Show.